thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm Larry Butler for the EHCC. Last I checked, glasses. Yeah, okay, we'll do glasses. <laughs> and I'm delighted you're with me. Um, if I can figure out how to share the screen, I will start my talk. So there, do you see uh, my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. Confucian traditions in East Asian music and the arts. Boy, that sounds so grand. It's a huge topic. Um, and I have to put in a disclaimer. I'm not a musician or a music historian. Um, I'm an art historian. And I first got interested in this topic through taking training in um, the Chinese classics aimed at professors and actually was happy to study with some of the great Confucian scholars of, of our time. And um, since then, I've traveled quite a bit in China and become familiar with this. What I'm really up to is, there we go, here we are. That's the Kodo class here at East Hawaii Cultural Center. They've just joined us, we're delighted, and I'm doing this talk kind of to, to welcome them to the fold and to give a little bit of historic context to what they're doing. So I say my expertise is more China. Uh, I've, I'm not a Japan expert at all, won't pretend to be, but I would like to kind of take the long view of what they're doing and connect it to the great East Asian Confucian tradition of music and the arts. Where does music come from? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? In China, they were sure that it comes from the interactions of the heaven and the earth as observed by the sages, like everything else. Um, somebody once quipped that Chinese civilization is unique and that the glory days were all at the beginning and it's been downhill ever since. Um, this is one example of that. But uh, the early sages were said to have studied the, the lightning and the rain and channeled it through the yin and the yang and the eight trigrams and the changes and all of those things and come up with the notion quite reasonably that music is an expression of the attunement of heaven and earth. And that it was necessary for the kings to encourage music because music would help harmonize literally the kingdoms with the heavens and the earth and would harmonize the people who lived in the kingdoms. So. The picture there on the right, we're being shown an early music master teaching music to future bureaucrats. And he's using a stringed instrument very much the way Plato probably did in ancient Greece, showing that harmonic relationships were measured out geometrically and seemed to be some sort of key to the heavens. Of course, music is also just a lot of fun. And I, I love this piece. This is bunch of little clay figurines, musicians went just doing a wonderful thing with acrobats in the foreground and we can see wind instruments and drums and chimes and just all sorts of mayhem here. And one of the main points I want to make here is that in the Confucian tradition there are really two sets of music and they're, they're quite separate. One is the music of this party here with tumblers and drinks and hoo-ha for everybody. The other very important aspect of music is music as a state bureaucratic in philosophical exercise that is linked very uh, closely to the other arts and linked to government itself. First thing I want to do is take a look at some of the ancient instruments that we know from ancient China, the archaeology, the texts, and which have spread in various forms throughout East and Southeast Asia, to Korea, to Japan, to Vietnam, um, and perhaps even further afield. And what I'm going to do here is walk you through this wonderful little book, um, Sounds of the Silk Road. It's kind of misleading. It's not the Silk Road. It's East and South Asia mostly. But it's uh, instruments taken from the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, if you want a place to start with just the instruments of East Asia. This is a great little book I recommend. First of all, we have wind instruments. We know them from archeology. span We know them from modern examples. On the left there, that's actually a bamboo pan flute that was excavated from a fifth century BC tomb that we'll be coming back to. Yes, indeed. And on the right is a, a wonderful pan pipe that's been set into a bright red case 
It's now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Other wind instruments you might know from Chinese music. There is the sheng, which is a, a mouth organ and it has various numbers of pipes. Um, it's changed over time and, and the, the time is a very long time. We find images from the Han Dynasty back around year zero, if there was a year zero, uh, showing people honking away on these wonderful mouth organs. And there's a, somebody's photo of a nice gentleman in Beijing in 2018 that I got from <laughs> Wikipedia. I love it. One of my favorite things about China, by the way, is I just love the parks. You just never know what you're gonna find in the parks. So there's somebody in the park having a good time with the shang. Percussion. Chinese music is all about percussion. Of course, if you've ever been to a Chinatown parade, you know that with a dragon snaking around. There are drums, there are gongs. There's both portable ones and ones on stands. And the gong is the same thing. Um, not just big gongs like we have in the gamelan, but also the little tiny. That rack there on the right is a set of gongs about the size of dinner saucers um, that are meant to be played along with uh, whatever else is going on. Stringed instruments, um, there's really three major types of stringed instruments. There are lutes, and uh, on the left you see a Chinese sanxian lute, three string lute. Uh, it's 19th century, uh, these are all in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. In the center is a Japanese deriv uh, derivative, very similar, and on the right, a second kind of stringed instrument, not a lute, but a fiddle, where you play with a bow. And as you know, these are all over South and East Asia and Southeast Asia, um, with various parents in the background, we guess. Maybe the most famous of the Chinese lutes is the pipa, or the Japanese biwa. These are both uh, 19th, 20th century examples in the museum. And you can see the one on the left, the pipa has got frets. Those are the horizontal little things that help you hit the right note in the right place. And there are fewer frets on the Japanese one, but that's a big deal in stringed instruments. Are they fretted or do you have to just sort of know where to put your fingers like on a violin? This is a very old instrument. And in fact, it's probably not Chinese or East Asian at all. It's probably a um, distant relative of the oud and even the guitar. Um, something that came in from probably Iran, maybe North India, in the great days of the Silk Road. And this is everybody's favorite. This is from the Chinese Tang Dynasty period, about 8th century, but it was sent with a bunch of other treasures to Japan in the early Japanese period and is now part of the treasure of the Todaiji Temple in Nara. And you can see the association there with West Asia, Central Asia. There's a a distinctly Western looking guy sitting on top of a camel playing this instrument with a palm tree in the background. All the associations um, really point to the Silk Road and that may well be the origin. When it hits China, you see it as sort of a fun instrument with Iranian musicians. And you also see it as a, an instrument associated with the Huris of heaven in any of the Buddhist caves. They all have good taste. Then there are the zithers. And I'm gonna do a lot with the zithers tonight. The zither is when you have a bunch of strings stretched across a sounding board and you pluck them. This is what the koto is, and I'll show you some other uh, examples of zithers as well. This is the s, and the s is a 25 stringed instrument that we know from deep antiquity. They've been excavated in um, tombs from the 5th century BC where they seem fully developed, so they're probably older than that. Where they originate, who knows. But this is a, a fairly loud instrument. They're usually about four feet long. And this is something you would play in a big ensemble. Everybody stomping their feet and banging drums and playing the wind instruments. And the S could keep up with it. It's a little hard to play. It's big and it had to be tuned specially. The more popular derivative is the zhang or gu zhang. Gu means ancient. And this is really the ancestor of the koto. And 
experience that you find in Korea and in Vietnam. The big news here is that the Jung is going to have bridges that are movable, and that's how you tune the strings. You don't twist anything, you don't pull anything, you simply shift those around. And if you've been to the Koto class here at the EHCC, you remember the first thing that happens is the master goes around and adjusts everybody's tuning bridges so that everything is tuned correctly. This probably started as a smaller and easier to use version of the S. Um, early 20th century, it was standardized with 16 strings, and now they're kind of as many strings as you want to deal with. And yes, you can buy them electrified. <laughs> they're, they're still very popular in China and they're very closely related to the Koto. One I've enjoyed on my trips to Vietnam is the Dan Trang, which is another descendant of the Gujang. Um, these are usually played by female musicians when you see them in public. It's a very graceful instrument, sort of like harp arpeggios. Um, in antiquity, it would not have been primarily a woman's instrument. Uh, it would have been played by both men and women, in fact. Here's a qin or a gu qin, which is the instrument most closely associated with Confucius and I'm gonna spend some time on it. This is the scholar's instrument par excellence. This is the instrument that sometimes in Chinese is called the, the mother of all instruments. It's the instrument associated with the sages, associated with Confucius, and for generations ever after, it has been um, the instrument for a serious musician to master. I understand there's a, a Guchin society in New York and God knows where else, so it's still alive and well. You see how it works. It does not have tuning bridges. Rather, the strings are pulled from the right end there and pulled across to the left end. They're pulled through holes and they are knotted at the bottom. The strings are made of silk and um, the little pegs, you see little pegs maybe along the lower edge of the strings. Those are like the pegs on a guitar or even some ukuleles where you can see where different notes fall and that helps you to play them. Nowadays, and for most of its history, it was a seven string instrument. Occasionally there's variation, but the seven string guqin is, is the standard. They go way, way back, like all these others. Um, on the left side, there are three that have come from burials from the fifth through the second century BC. Uh, wonderfully preserved. Some of those burials is just amazing. The wood is preserved. Even sometimes textiles are preserved. Of course, much better preserved is ceramics. And there's a lady playing the Guqin from the Eastern Han. That would be uh, 200 BC to zero. She's got a big smile. It reminds us that although later the, the Qin is associated with aristocratic men, um, it also was, has always been played by women as well. How do these things work? Well, here's a little diagram I got from one of my books, which shows you on the left is the top with a string stretched out. And in the middle is what you see inside. It is hollow. There's a top board and a bottom board. And on the right there is the bottom board, which as time goes on, becomes more and more elaborately decorated. In Confucius's time, that would have been just black lacquer and conspicuously plain as part of the austerity of a serious scholar. They require tuning pegs. Since you don't have bridges, you've got to have some way to adjust those strings in a hurry. So at the far end from where the strings emerge, you've got tuning pegs. Um, often they're bronze and gilded, and there's something that are commonly found now in excavations and really beautiful things. They often have animal figures, and some of the animal figures have got scholars thinking that the origin of the Qin may in fact be the Eurasian steppes to the Northeast of China. It shows all those wonderful animal motifs of the animal style of the, of the uh, early Silk Road. We don't really know. We don't know the origin in China. But what we can say is that they are exquisitely beautiful instruments that got more so over time. This is probably everybody's introduction to the Guqin, 
And maddeningly, he doesn't call it a, a chin or a zither. He calls it a lute. It's not a lute. <laughs> a lute is one of these things that you hold up and play, like an ukulele. Uh, <laughs> he explains, well, I called it a lute because to his mind, when well, this is written in 1940, lute sounded more scholarly, and he really wanted to convey a scholarly sense. And people have been confused ever since. Anyway, this is Robert Van Gulick, and some of you might know him from the Judge D novels he wrote. He was a Dutch um, Chinese linguist who worked in diplomatic posts all over East Asia and China and in Japan before the First World War, before the Second World War, and uh, an enormously erudite scholar. And if you just want to learn something about the Guqin, this is a great place to, to start. It's in print. I just got mine recently. Um, if it isn't in there, nobody knows. <laughs> Another place to look at, and I'm taking some of my ideas and a few of my pictures from this, is this huge website called silkchin.com by a contemporary New York chin player, John Thompson, who was trained in Taiwan and uh, has put together this enormous compendium. Um, and it includes music recordings, video recordings, all sorts of essays, links galore. It's in Chinese and English. Um, if you're interested in the topic, have at it. And I, I have to apologize. I put very little music actually into this presentation uh, for the simple reason that these are going to be put up on YouTube and I'm a little leery of copyright violations. So I haven't put anybody else's music up in this PowerPoint, just that one film that I filmed. <laughs> so those are some good sources. Let's take a look at some of the archaeology closer up. And I'm getting a lot of this from Music in the Age of Confucius, a show that was at the Sackler and Freer Gallery in Washington in 2000, which again is one of the spurs to me thinking about all of this. It was wonderful. They got a few ancient examples, they owned some bells, and they combined it with Confucian philosophy and made a fascinating exhibit. So if you're interested in the Confucian aspect of music, I would strongly suggest getting a hold of a copy of this um, that attacks music from the archaeology, from philosophy, from popular practice, and it's written by really the leading scholars. So what do they follow? Well, 1978, they finished excavation of one of the most remarkable sites in, ever excavated in China, the tomb of the Marcus of Yi. Marcus Yi of Zhang, where's that? It's in Hubei, which is in central southern China. It's on the Yangtze. Um, the capital is Wuhan that we're all familiar with now. And that's where the objects are now in the Wuhan Museum, one of China's great, great museums. It's this remarkable tomb from, look at that, mid fifth century BC, that's 2,500 years ago. They dug up what looks to be kind of a conceptual palace. The central room, seems to be ceremonial and that's where they found the big musical instruments. In the upper room they found his tomb. I'm sorry, no, that was a storage stuff. On the right is his tomb room with a smaller musical ensemble of seemingly less serious instruments. And oh dear, on the left, those are 22 of his concubines all strangled to death for the occasion. Sorry about that. There they all are. Let's take a look at the bells. Let's not think about the concubines just now. Um, anyway, they found the most remarkable thing. They found a complete bell set with 65 bronze bells with gold, gilded inscriptions inlaid into each bell explaining what it is. Oh my goodness, this is the best source we have on early Chinese music. It doesn't just say what note it is, and it does, it even talks here and there in the inscriptions, talk about different tuning systems um, in ways that are baffling to modern scholars, but never mind, there they are. They've been able to reassemble the thing and even play it. It's in playable condition. Here's how a bell would look. And these are meant to be suspended from a rack, from a bronze or wooden rack. And you note right off the bat, the bell is almond shaped, it's not round. And acoustic scientists have studied this and found that that in fact produces a much richer sound, much more pleasing than just plink, plink, plink. 
they've also found, this is really strange, every one of these bells makes two different sounds, depending where you hit it. And I've got a close-up here in the picture. Um, if you hit the main note, we'll call it the, the A note, it's at the bottom of the bell. Oh, you can't see where I'm pointing. Ah, I've got an arrow. Can you see the arrow? Maybe so. Right here, this says, okay, this is the A tone. And off to the side will be another marker saying this is the B tone. The B tone, if you strike the A tone, you get one note. You strike the B side, you get a higher pitch, a minor third above. How that works is beyond me. Hey, I'm an art historian. I'm not an acoustician. But it apparently does work. And furthermore, the inscriptions tell us all sorts of things. This one here tells us that this bell was made for the Marcus of Yi of Tang. Cool. So there it is. Um, the little knobs that stick out apparently are for fine tuning the pitches and they agonized over these pitches. Now beyond this, this is an absolutely gorgeous piece of bronze casting, isn't it? And one of the things that scholars are still trying to figure out is how on earth the bronze casters arrived at this point of this extraordinary sophistication where they can make 65 bells with two tones each. They cover, by the way, the entire 12 step chromatic scale, the same one we're familiar with on the piano, though it seems to have been used for pentatonic music, five note music, five note scales. But the idea was you could play these things in all sorts of different scales. And some of them actually will tell you, oh, if you use this one, then you can play this mode. You start with that one, you're playing in that mode. So the language is extraordinary. It's telling people all about these things. So here's how they look today in, uh, oh, I misspelled, it's not Marcus of Yi, it's Marcus Yi of Dong. I was in too much of a hurry, sorry about that. Um, Here's how they look today, and we think this is the way they were arranged. Scholars have been crawling all over this from the, since the 70s, figuring out what the different bell sets represent. And it seems that the main, the longest thing there on the right, this is the main uh, stuff. And this, this covers about three and a half octaves. But then you've got subsets that are for special use here and there. And it would obviously take several musicians working with hammers like this. And these are guys actually doing it. They're in the museum. And they've actually made recordings from this thing. Bang, 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 bang. Um, and of course they have to know where to hit because you got two different notes available on each particular bell. I have to read you this one thing. Um, again, the scientists are trying to figure out how this all worked. Whoops. They read these inscriptions. Some of them are very long. Let's see. The inscription contains one of these extraordinary footnotes. It uses a normal eight tone definition using the Zong pitch standard and says, this is the starting pitch when the starting pitch is in Sui Bin mode. Then it says, Sui Bin's name in Chu is Bin Huang, in Shang its name is Yi Zi. And with that particular bit of international relations out of the way, it continues, this is me when starting pitch is Tai Zhou, and two major thirds above Do when the starting pitch is Wu Yi. It is a major third above Re when the starting pitch is from Huang Zhong. Good grief. <laughs> the book, by the way, goes on to say, if that baffles you, dear reader, believe me, it baffles the rest of us as well. But what it does tell us is that in these great state bell things, um, a tremendous amount was, is, was at stake more than just music. For one thing, only the absurdly wealthy could absorb, it could afford bronzes. And we know for the Chinese Bronze Age and bronze cultures like the, the Zhou Dynasty, that when this was made, that an enormous amount of being wealthy was the control of bronze. And an enormous part of being the emperor was to be the ultimate controller of bronze with the nine great bronze tripods. And so just possessing one of these bell sets is tremendously prestigious. One bell is an oddball. Oops, excuse me, there we go. One bell is an oddball. This one doesn't match the others, but it's inscribed and says that 
King Yanshang of Chu Wei Temple implements for Marcus Yizong and place them at the Temple Yidong, Xiang. May they be forever cherished and used in sacrificing. This tells us that another of the important functions of these bell sets and really of music in general at the court was to accompany the ritual sacrifice, which is so much part of ancient Chinese culture. Um, one question that comes up that nobody has the answer to yet is how closely is this whole bronze culture of Shang and Zhou China related to say the Dongsan culture of Vietnam, which is right on the edge. Clearly there's some technological back and forth, but we also wonder if there was some sharing of the notion of a ruler controlling bronze. And I'm thinking of these great bronze drums that originated in what's now North Vietnam around Hanoi. These would be suspended sideways from the picture and were used in all royal rituals. They were used, we think, to summon the monsoon rains. They were used to just demonstrate royal prestige. And there are some 200 of these still existing all around uh, Southeast and East Asia, widely distributed, which leads people to wonder, <laughs> is there some really distant connection to say Indonesian gamelan? And I think the obvious answer is, of course there is, um, where you've got a whole culture of ceremonial and ritual instruments using a variety of drums and pot gongs and suspended gongs um, and all the rest of those things. I also have an impression from my reading that nobody's quite figured this out yet, but they'd all love to know whether, say, the pentatonic tuning in a cylindro mode in a gamelan is related closely to the pentatonic tuning of ancient Chinese bronzes. We'll leave that open till they tell us definitely. Here's another instrument that comes up in the great courts. Believe it or not, stones. Um, these are limestone. Actually, what you've got here are replicas. I guess the limestones didn't come out very well. But this is from the same tune, uh, Marcus Yitzang. It's 32 stone chimes, and the support is original. These wonderful, wonderful mythological animals supporting the, uh, the stone rack. And again, I'm thinking of our gamelan with the wonderful serpents supporting the gong shed. Uh, coincidence or more than coincidence, I don't know. Guqin. Yes, of course we have the Guqin. Coming from the same excavation. Doesn't look like much, but this is what they've got. The top shows it put together. The four tuning pegs are modern. Those are replicas. And the bottom picture shows the thing opened up like a sandwich. You can see the, the bottom board and the top board. So it'd be hollow for resonating and the strings would stretch across. This was actually a 10 string one, which is unusual, but if you're, you know, Marcus Yi of Zong, I guess you get to have what you want. Unusually in the tomb, it's undecorated. And this also seems to be part of the sort of ritual aspect of the Guqin. It was too important an instrument, too sacred an instrument to be glopped up with decoration, at least at this point. So let's put them all back together again, ritual and music. Oh my goodness, look at this. Uh, it's a drawing from a bronze ritual wine vessel showing the whole orchestra just going nuts. It's wonderful. There's drums, there's wind instruments. Down the bottom left, you can see they're banging on bells, they're banging on wooden chimes, having a wonderful time. Um, all the depictions we have of this music, we do have a lot of depictions. Um, very rarely show these orchestras as being sedate. It shows them whooping it up and having a really good time. I hope that was true. Let's bring Confucius into this. Little reminder, the name is so familiar. Who is he? He was a real historical figure, very much so. Gentleman, scholar, statesman in the exact same period as this tomb excavation, um, which is one reason the tomb excavation is so exciting. It was basically during his lifetime that that stuff was assembled. Um, he was a teacher of philosophy and the arts and particularly taught them as necessary for the service of society. Um, he also is traditionally regarded as the editor of the five Confucian classics of ancient Zhou dynasty Chinese literature. That's late Bronze Age. Um, did he really do all that? Oh, who knows at this point? You know, the, the man and the legend are, are all mixed up. 
but he certainly credited and certainly was very familiar with the Book of Songs or the Book of Odes, one of the great, great Chinese classics from the early Zhou Dynasty. Um, it, the Book of Songs was a, a collection of folk poems. Well, how nice. He also was familiar with the Book of Music. We don't have that anymore. We just have a few quotes from it and I've embedded one or two in here. How did this all come together? Well, his concerns, reminder, filial piety, both in the family and the state, that the family should model itself on the state with loyalty to the emperor and the emperor should model himself on the family as the pater familias. He wanted self-cultivation from gentlemen. I don't think he addressed gentle ladies, sorry. Benevolence, which is a kind of a hard to translate word, run in Chinese, um, benevolence, doing good, being good hearted, that this is necessary for a gentleman. And the way you hold it all together is through ritual. Ritual controls behavior and assures a harmonious society. And ritual and music are tightly locked together. You can't have ritual without the music. I mentioned the, the Book of Song, the Shi Jing. Um, it's a, a remarkable thing. Now, these five great classic volumes are the things that every later Confucian scholar would study and memorize. His, his works were canonized in the Han Dynasty, that's 200 BC to 200 AD. And from then on, Confucian become, or Confucius himself becomes virtually godlike, and his writings are memorized by anybody who wants an education and are used by the state to select out scholars through the exam system. I just have one here. I'll just give you a flavor. What are these? Are folk songs from probably like seven, eight hundred BC? Let's see, where is one here? Oh, peach tree, young and fresh, bright, bright its blossoms. This girl's getting married, she'll do well in her new home. Peach tree, young and fresh, plump are its fruits. This girl's getting married, she'll do well in her new rooms. Peach tree, young and fresh, its leaves lush and full. This girl's getting married. She'll do all right by her new people. The songs are like that. They're short. They're usually um, four syllables in a line. They're, they're fresh. They're bright. They're clearly not folk language. They've been processed through the Zhou dynasty court language. But still, Confucius understood them as not just folk songs, but as the way for an intellectual to learn about the people. Study these songs, memorize them, and you will gain insight into the man and woman in the village. And so they became kind of codified learning. And of course, as time goes on, some Chinese scholars say, oh, no, really, they're all just allegorical. And no, really, they're all just political. But I think in their origin, they really are fresh young girl, a peach tree going to her marriage. And, things like that. So it's nice, it's a humanizing touch. It's how he taught benevolence. Learn the Book of Songs and you will learn benevolence by learning the people's heart. So put it all together, here's some, some snippets from his Analects of Confucius, which is the major book of sayings of Confucius, collected after his death by his disciples. Let's see, let a man be first incited by the songs, the book of songs, then given a firm footing by the study of ritual and finally perfected by music. Bring all those together, the book of songs, the study of ritual and the music itself. A man who is not good, not benevolent, that word, what can he have to do with ritual? A man who is not benevolent, what can he have to do with music? He saw them all as a package. What rituals are we talking about? Well, there's a great state rituals, but also the family rituals. Um, here in the Met in New York is this extraordinary set from the Zhou dynasty, um, again, from Confucius's time, maybe fifth century BC or later, or earlier actually. They represent a family, a rich family's ritual set for the family altar through which they would communicate with the ancestors and honor the ancestors. 
you actually would make food in the food dishes. You actually would boil it up. You would make mulled wine. You would serve it. You would have somebody's grandson sitting there as sort of a spirit trap acting for grandpa. Now, grandpa's dead, but, you know, the kid gets to eat and drink everything. And once he's fallen over from drinking too much, the spirits are satisfied. And the communication between the living and the dead is continued. So again, the family and the state reflect each other through this kind of ritual. It would, of course, be accompanied by music. Confucius himself was said to be quite the good Guqin player. And there he is on the left, lecturing to his students on the apricot tree platform. On the right there is my photo of <laughs> that very spot in Chufu, his hometown in Shandong province. We're not quite sure if he's teaching them the qin or if he merely played the qin while teaching. People take both sides of that argument. But in any case, he was considered quite good at it. And there's all sorts of anecdotes in the Analects about, oh, he tried playing it three days after the end of the mourning period for his parents. And he did his best, but the notes came out sour. So sad. Here's the temple. This is you know, one tiny bit of the temple. The temple is like a mile long of hall after hall after hall after hall in Confucius's hometown, Chufu. Um, again, my photo from, what, 2017. This is the temple at the very far end of all the line of temples. And inside there is his image enthroned. And you notice that right in front of him are the sacrifice implements. There is the food, the wine, flowers, incense. But off to the left is a complete orchestra, including, um, you can see them very well right here. Those are stone chimes. And here are some Guqin sitting there waiting. So even today, any Confucius temple you go to is going to be all wrapped up in music. He's buried there in Chufu. And again, that's my picture from 2017. I didn't have the nerve to do it. I was too self-conscious. But I did do it later that year in Nanjing. So in honor of my Confucian teachers, I bowed and lit the incense <laughs> and no one laughed. It was very nice of them. So he's very much a living presence. And in fact, the Kong family, his own family is a huge force in Shandong province and in China in general. They keep careful records of every single descendant of Confucius. And anybody in that vast family knows exactly where they stand. And here's his birthday party every year in Chufu. Okay, Confucius. Confucius leaves this enormous um, legacy on later Chinese scholars. Somewhere in the Analects, it says that a good person knows how to play the Guqin. So guess what? Every good scholar <laughs> needs to at least pretend to be able to play the Guqin. Let's take a look at this. The people I'm talking about are the literati. Literati is the English word for the educated men and yes, women of the upper class who by day would be government bureaucrats. They learned their Confucian classics. They passed the exam. They're the governor of Huha province. And at night, they are expected to go back to their beautiful study like this one and surround themselves with antiquities. You see a table there full of ancient bronzes and jades and all those good things, um, musical instruments. You might do some calligraphy. You might do a little painting. These are all e expected to be the arts at the fingertips of an educated man and some educated women as well. These are the people that had these fantastically beautiful urban gardens in places like Suzhou, uh, but really all around the uh, Yangtze Valley and now in Beijing as well, where you would, you know, you'd have your garden, you would cultivate an imitation landscape with rocks and streams, and your friends would all pretend these are mountains. And you might catch the view of a temple in the background like this lucky garden. And in your study, you would be surrounded with, again, all those good things. This is one reconstructed in Minneapolis. There's another one in the Met, but this one looks to me better <laughs> with stuff. What would you really do all day? Well, I have this wonderful thing from the Chinese Scholar Studio, which, 
Um, it talks about the Ming Dynasty. That's around, oh, 1400, 1500, thereabouts. Somebody actually wrote down everything you're supposed to do as a Confucian scholar, as a, as a literatus. Let's see, domestic routines would be educating the sons and playing with the grandchildren, leisurely conversation with the old ladies, entertaining young concubines, meeting visitors, taking food and drink as their desired, well-prepared food, but not extravagant. Then there are the studio routines for this room. 13 items, spreading out the books for browsing for my own pleasure, burning incense, making tea, sampling spring water, playing the chin, meditating, copying, imitating model calligraphy, contemplating a painting, playing with a brush and ink, observing the fish swimming in the ponds, listening to the birds, studying flowers and trees, deciphering odd scripts, and enjoying the wrinkled rocks. It's amazing they got anything else done, isn't it? <laughs> oh, the painting. You're expected, an educated person is expected to be able to use the pen. And much is made of the literati's amateur status. It wasn't always true, but it was the polite fiction. If you could write well with a brush, then you could paint well with the brush and you would write poetry. And traditionally, those are the three great arts of Confucian society. Calligraphy, painting, and poetry. And an educated man or woman should be able to do all three. Uh, and yes, here's an educated woman, uh, Guang Daosheng, famous for her bamboo painting uh, in the Yuan Dynasty. She couldn't travel, so, you know, she's locked up in the house, couldn't really paint mountains and things. That wouldn't be proper for a woman. But she could certainly paint the garden and the bamboo and the flowers and the children and things of that sort. It's considered one of the great masters of bamboo painting in brush and ink. So these are the people that are learning to play the guchin, the music. Um, one funny thing, when you see the paintings, lots of paintings of scholars, they're never carrying their own. There's always some little guy behind them that's carrying it for them. These are rich people, you know. <laughs> what can you do? Well, there's um, one of the emperors sitting under a pine tree, which is a nice place to sit, with a little vase of flowers next to him. That's a good thing. There's probably some incense somewhere, entertaining his friends playing the guchin. And with lots of images of these things. Um, on the left, there's somebody playing the, the guchin, and in the foreground, from the back, we see his buddy playing the, um, the pipa, the lute. There's some discussion. Are you supposed to sing to the guchin, or is it just esoteric noises? Well, they are very esoteric. It's a slow, deep, meditative music. But Confucius used it to sing the Book of Songs, and so um, it seems like that's not really much of an argument. But there were people, of course, later China said, oh, no, no, it's too serious an instrument. You mustn't sing. You must only play slow, deep, meditative music um, and enjoying nature and philosophy. It was understood that you could not play the guchin if you did not know philosophy and art. So it's very much a gentleman's instrument. In fact, um, there's another list I won't read you of where you can play the chin. It's appropriate in your study. It's appropriate for your friends. Where do you not play it? Oh, you don't play it in the street. You don't play it in court. And you never play it in front of a barbarian who does not know Chinese music. It's not for barbarians. They were collected really ever since. Confucius, and they get more and more elaborate over time. These are some wonderful preserved examples in various museums. You notice they tend to have kind of a ripply edge to help grip a little bit in crucial places. On the back, there's usually a long inscription that might give the name of the Guqin. They're, they're all named if they're famous. You can see they have seven strings and those little dots to help you find the right notes. They're associated with pine trees. They're associated with a crane. You see the crane dancing in the left there? The crane is a symbol of longevity. And there's all sorts of stories of people playing the guchin and a, a crane shows up and dances. Or sitting in front of a waterfall on the right there, there's some guy and his buddy contemplating a waterfall. And that's a very appropriate place for deep meditative music. This is my favorite. A guchin in the shape of a banana leaf. Yes, 
yes, I want this. Um, there's a top and the bottom there. You can see on the bottom, it's got the inscription. The banana, <laughs> the banana leaf has a particular niche in Chinese literati culture. Uh, my house is surrounded by bananas. Both my houses are surrounded by bananas because everyone knows that a scholar takes delight in listening to the rain falling on the banana leaves. It's this wonderful cliche in literary culture. It gets, some of you might know in Japanese literature as well, uh, Basho writes about it in Japan. Ah, yes, the sound of the rain on the banana leaves. So I think it's wonderful that somebody's actually come up with a chin in the shape of a banana leaf. <laughs> All-purpose pleasure instrument. Oh, a few other little topics here to think about. Buddhism and music in China. Um, Buddhism, of course, is an import. And actually, so a lot, of, a lot of the musical instruments seem to be imported as well from the Northwest along the Silk Roads. Uh, ultimately, a lot of Chinese instruments can be traced to India, um, particularly in India. Uh, but it shows up frequently in Buddhist art. You can see on the left there, there are angels in heavens. The, um, the immortals are playing musical instruments and flying things. They're playing. Oh, in the center, there is an immortal playing a uh, pipa, the lute. And on one side, there's somebody playing something like the Qin. On the right, there's a wall fresco from a Buddhist cave from the Tang Dynasty, and we can see more instruments. The lute, oh, there's a harp, um, which is no longer a Chinese instrument. It's still used in Burma, but not in China anymore. Wind instruments as well. In Japan, the tradition goes way, way back to the Heian period, uh, which corresponds to the Tang Dynasty in China, when Buddhism and the Chinese court traditions are imported into Japan. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole history of that. I'm not a Japan expert. But short form for our sakes is that Japan inherits the court music tradition, known uh, as gagaku now, where you have the, the formal instruments and a formal arrangement that are used for rituals, including imperial rituals. Uh, this is not music that's about partying and, and all that. This is courtly music. It tends to be very archaic. And my musicology friends tell me that in fact, Japanese music probably preserves early Chinese court music better than anything in China. That's true in the art as well. So I'm, I'm interested to hear that. In other words, the ancient court music of Japan, the gagaku music probably reflects something of Tang dynasty court music. All sorts of instruments come over, um, the lutes come over, and it's the shamisen, the shamisen, the kokyu is the fiddle, and there's a woman playing the koto. Again, the koto is not derived directly from the qin with its seven strings. The koto is derived from the zhang with its more like 16 strings that are held up with little tuning bridges. A modern koto has 13 strings that are tuned with movable tuning bridges. But these quickly become part of the popular culture of Japanese music. In fact, that's a 19th century image of a women orchestra rocking and rolling there. Here's the koto. Here's a, a modern koto. Look very much, I'm just the same instrument that um, our group, the Soshin Kai are playing now in the uh, East Hawaii Cultural Center. And as some of you know, the first thing the teacher does is go and adjust everybody's tuning bridges so that everything's in tune properly. There's some discussion, it sounds pretty in, uh, inconclusive, about the role of women as koto players. Clearly, it became a courtesan instrument in Japan, but it also seems to have stayed a court instrument. So, for instance, on the left there is an image of a noble lady who is welcoming the Lord home. And she is nobody's courtesan. She's somebody's concubine or wife and is uh, clearly a, a master of the, of the koto. The chin does make it to Japan. It's never been a popular instrument, but 
Here is yet another treasure from the Tang Dynasty period that's now in the Shosuin and Nara, preserved in the treasury there. Um, the top and the bottom are shown, very, very elaborately decorated. This is the same place that has that wonderful lute with the image of the foreigner sitting on a camel playing the lute. It's that same treasure. But again, it seems to have stayed a very esoteric instrument that's only used in the Gagaku tradition, primarily. Of course, everything changes now with the internet. But when the Guchin becomes more popular in Japan, seems to be the 19th century. And people are still arguing, oh, it's somebody brought over in the 17th century. Oh, maybe it was the 18th. I'm not going to get into that. I have no expertise. But somewhere in recent centuries, the, the Qin does make it to Japan as a more popular instrument than it had been. And we start getting all of these printed manuals. That's actually notation, which is uh, clearly in kanji in, in Chinese script, even for Japanese readers. Wonderful illustrations of finger techniques. I love these. Um, the koto is very difficult, and a lot of it depends on, I said not the koto, but the qin is very difficult. A lot of it depends on your hand position. You make different kinds of strokes, different kinds of sounds. And here the various authors are comparing different hand positions to say the claws of a dragon or the flight of a bird. I guess that helps. <laughs> So let me wrap this up. What if this is still around? Oh, lots and lots of it. 20th century, 21st century, now, especially with the internet, there's been a huge revival in interest in the ancient Confucian instruments, the various ones. This is um, a performance I attended in 2017 in Xi'an, where they have actually reconstructed the, um, the bell shed of Marcus Yi of Zhang all 65. I'm not sure they got all of them in there, but um, even the, the little statues there are copied from the excavations. So it's entered popular culture now. And the internet and TikTok and all that have made a, a huge resurgence in the ancient instruments. Now, of course, electrified and set to strobe lights, if you like. I remember this being a very noisy performance. Um, it, the court, until its dissolution in 1913, the Chinese imperial court still continued to use the ancient Confucian instruments for important state rituals, such as the beginning of the agricultural season in the Temple of Heaven. Um, this is a stone chime set now in the uh, Palace Museum in Beijing that was used during the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty of China. All around, East Asia in other Confucian societies, such as uh, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, there is huge interest from one way or another. Um, this example, 1984, the Confucian Academy in Seoul, Korea, clearly they are trying to channel fifth century BC music. They've got the Guchin down there that he's playing. Behind them is a set of stone chimes. He's dressed as Confucianly as he can. So this is from a, you know, a traditionalist perspective, learning the music. It's also popped up huge now in Chinese movies, where if you want to create a mood that is you know, deep and decorous, you have some old guy playing the Guchin and everybody gets solemn about it. So <laughs> I got this from Wikipedia. I love that picture. How to make your action movie sound profound. Throw in a Gucci. And of course, you've got the young folks doing unspeakable things with electronics and new music. And yes, indeed, there is a revival of koto. Uh, not just the traditional koto playing, such as we have here at EHCC, but new age, vibro, electro, <laughs> punk rock koto and it's all over the internet. Um, Darren, the, the leader of, of the Koto group here, told me that one of his students has actually done a speech, on, uh, did a paper on modern day Koto, and I, I watched it, it's on YouTube, and it's just absolutely wonderful, um, seeing how young musicians are picking up on the old traditions. So, if I can give you one more bit of music here. That is my little sweeping context for our new guests at the HCC.
and I thank you all very much for your attendance. Um, this will be posted at some point to YouTube, God help us. Uh, special thanks to Dara Miyashiro and Marisa Miyashiro and uh, Monique and Kelly and Marissa for all their help in my getting this thing organized. Um, Carol wants me to say, I think that we'd love to have a survey. I don't know how that works. Carol, do you know how that works? No, Carol doesn't know how that works. So, um, one more thing, if anybody's interested. No. Oh, Carol? No, no this will be <laughs> Oh, hi, Moni. Um, this will be posted hi. along with the other. So if you want some, some additional reading, here are the sources I used and help yourself. So thank you so much. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yes. Um, I was just going to say, if you all go to your um, chat window, there's a link right there to the survey. I will also be sending a follow-up so you can uh, do the survey at another time as well, because once we close this window, the link will disappear. Yeah, we're really grateful for any feedback. Um, believe it or not, it helps with things like funding. <laughs> so we'd appreciate any survey answers. What else? Question. Yeah, Steve. At what point did notation systems evolve with regard to Confucian music? Were, were there any notation systems? I think I need to get my earphones. Hang on here. Do -do 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 -do. Oh. Let's try this. Okay, try me again. At what point did notation systems hmm. become a part of the tradition? Oh, that's a great question. Um, as far back as that excavated tomb, 5th century BC, we're seeing evidence of a notation system because they had specific symbols for specific notes of the scale. Mm. Um, now, how they would write that down, or if they'd write that down, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody does. But from the Han Dynasty on, which is 200 BC, 200 AD, roughly, um, from then on, you've got manuals, and there's all sorts of different notation systems, so there isn't just one. Um, they usually use Chinese characters, uh, even in, in the Japanese tradition. I noticed the Koto at EHCC. The um, strings are numbered in Chinese with the Chinese characters for the numbers. So that still continues. I, I showed you a couple examples. There, it seems to be lots of different symbols uh, used by different people. Hmm. So How's that for not an answer? No, hmm? there was a notation system then from antiquity. There were, we assume so because the theory seems to have been very complex, the music theory. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Cynthia, what do you think? Understandably why yeah. 2,000 years later you'd have a, a cultural revolution. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. Um, so, the Guqing, so it, it sounds like the Koto, is, is that what it sounds like? Oh, I wish I had a recording. Um, it's deeper. It's actually deeper. Uh -huh. um, and there are fewer strings. Mm -hmm. And there's more emphasis on the way you touch the strings the way you vibrate, the way you sing from one into another. Um, so a lot of it is kind of body language music. Uh, does it have a lot of volume? No, it's, uh, I should mention it's a very quiet instrument, yeah. which is why it's more appropriate for contemplation than for, um, say, an orchestral setting. I guess that's uh, because it doesn't have a bridge, because the bridge is what would you know, make the uh, mm -hmm. essential in the tone. Um, I also think it's interesting that they also came up with a 12-tone scale. It's, I guess, yeah, you, you can't get around physics. No, that really surprised me. They're using a 12-note chromatic scale. They said it's very close to our tuning system. And, of course, also the pentatonic. Yeah. Um, the, the wonderful thing about that gigantic 65 bell set is that apparently they could start scales from anywhere and would uh -huh. apparently learn as part of their training to, just like we do, how do you play different keys? What do you skip? What do you hit? Yeah, I, I wonder if the music ever got, you know, totally chromatic, if they ever went like Arnold Schoenberg on stuff, you know? I don't really know, because um, we don't, what we don't have is we don't have any annotated music from antiquity. We just don't. 
Yeah. Um, and it's not until the Han we get even manuals for how to play. And nowadays, recordings I have sound awfully kind of modern romantic stuff, you know, people would play at restaurants. Um, I, I don't think Confucian <laughs> music started at restaurants, but there's a number of pieces that have come down, handed down with traditional tunes. So it, the Kota does have a traditional repertoire. Yeah, and um, also the uh, inscriptions on the bells, is that yeah. just like an, an early version, an earlier version of Chinese characters? Yeah, yeah. If you're scratching your head over them, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a it's seal script curvy. kind of a thing. Hmm? Yeah, it's more curvy. It's more curvy and elongated, really beautiful things. Um, I can't make much of them, but somebody can. <laughs> yeah, those yeah. chord instruments are just gorgeous. Yeah. And so do, the, do those bronze bells, do they just sound like the uh, like you know, typical bells, like just like any bells? Have you heard them? I have. They're, um, again, I, I, heard, I, I didn't put them in because I'm a little worried about copyright. But if you go to that website that I recommended, um, silkchin.com, they've got recordings, both of the, the chin and also some links to the bells. They sound kind of like what you'd expect from hitting a heavy piece of bronze. They're very, very heavy. So they're, they're not thin. They're not real resonant. But apparently they're resonant. To, they're more resonant if you hit them in the right place. And somebody just recently published, you know, if you heat them up, they're more resonant if they're warm. So they wonder, hmm, maybe they lit little candles under these things to make them resonate. But they're, they're not beautiful to our ears, but they were to Confucius's. And he yeah. would... Some of his anecdotes talk about him sitting and taking in the music with the chimes. I, I also think it's interesting that both Confucius as well as Plato talk about uh, using music to control to control the masses. Absolutely, yeah. and they also link them to geometry. Yeah, which is easy enough to do. Yeah, there's a you know, Gore Vidal actually wrote a novel once about the fact that. The 5th century BC seems to have been a really happening place all around the globe. You've got Confucius and the Plato and Socrates, and pretty soon you get Aristotle and, and yeah. you know, <laughs> all those people. Um, Zoroaster. So he comes up with this novel, which has a merchant kind of going across the Silk Road and meeting all of these guys one by one. <laughs> Gore Vidal wrote this? Yeah. Um, Gore Vidal, what's it called? Is it called Creation? I think it's Creation. Yeah. It's one of the ones you can actually show your mother. It's not embarrassing. <laughs> Other ideas? Okay, well then, thank you so much for your attention. I've enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Um, this will be edited somehow and posted somehow. Thank you so much, Monique, for doing that and for holding my hand today. Um, deeply appreciate it. So I guess I'm signing off. Thanks all.